And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek, en seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. Come Coming to a straight, coming to a straight from the from the land of hotel Wi-Fi at the moment, eh, and creator of sentient circuits. Which so we're leaning a little, we're leaning a bit further into science fiction than we did last time. The one and only Sean Barry. How how you doing today, man? Or tonight? <laughs> as long as I can be on the road. Oh. So I'd like to open at the humble beginnings, in a sense. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. So I grew up uh, with role-playing games. My father had a red box of D&D, mm -hmm. adv advanced D&D way back when, uh, and I discovered it when I was five or six, uh, going through some of the items on the shelf mm -hmm. and that, that became a way to bond with my father uh and of course i've kept that obsession and hobby through high school and college a uh, good way to break make friends break the ice uh because i moved every two or three years he was mm -hmm. air force yeah i got now were you were you mostly a D and D guy over the years, or did you experiment with other games as time passed? So, uh, D and D and Pathfinder were my main games through high school, and then in college, I was exposed to uh, Dark Heresy and the, that universe of games, and World of Darkness, both old and new. Mm -hmm. uh, those being the the three kind of systems that I have had first-hand exposure with. Mm -hmm. Now, it what I find what I find kind of interesting is with it within the names that you mentioned. Um, obviously, D and D and Pathfinder are fa are fantasy, although what kind of fantasy is debatable. <laughs> um, Dark he Dark Heresy is 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 science fantasy and all the and all the other stuff involved involved in the grim darkness of the forty first millennium. Um, and if G and GW, if you're listening, um, just because I brought your name up doesn't mean you can sue me. Right. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not, mo I'm not traveling to the UK just for, just for a damn lawsuit. <laughs> but, and, and of course, World of Darkness is, go is going with, um, mo is going with modern horror to along all that, well, that in modern horror and interpersonal politics, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so, but with all, but with all of that, you end, you end up going from, a, from a whole lot of, a whole lot of fantasy, um, fantasy or fantasy adjacent umbrella to a, to, in, to a science fit, to a science fiction game that has hard SF leanings where you are playing as androids. And I'm, yes. cu I'm curious. I'm curious what. I'm curious where you got the idea to do um, to do that particular style of science fiction and have androids be the um, protagonists. As a multifaceted individual. I'm also an engineer by trade. If my nerd nerd, nerd hat gonna get taller, um, and I had done some exploratory investigations of like traveler or uh the battletech slash mech warrior mm -hmm. systems and that none of that really filled the hole in my heart uh i enjoyed the power fantasy and escapism that D, &D often provides uh where mech warrior and traveler um while certainly exceptional people don't uh, 
don't make the same sort of groundbreaking, civilization-changing uh, adventures that some of these high fantasy games can get into. Mm-hmm. And so, when I began my idea for a game, uh, I wanted to make a resource-based game. The initial thought was that the resource would be permanent, which you'll notice is in the hard mode, the unwarranted, untested hard mode of the game, uh, where your power resources uh, finite and never recharges. Um, and coupling these two ideas of a power system and uh, heroic Figures, I, I came upon androids, um, thought that would be the best way to bring people into the game. Because if you go for any form of robot, it can be alienating and hard for a player to see themselves in. But androids being largely humanoid would ease the player into the mindset of being this heroic individual. Mm-hmm. Now... Since you mentioned since you mentioned Dark Heresy, I'm guessing I'm guessing that was the game that that gave you the inspiration to do a per, a percentile die setup. Yes. And I... the and um in the in that same in that same vein, um when it comes to when it comes the other thing that I the other thing that I noticed was the whole um, point system, like at having po- having point based um, character creation. Yes. Uh, so what I'm cu- what I'm curious about, and this is something that I often a- I often ask when it comes to ca- when it comes to point based character creation, is how do how do you handle the risk of choice paralysis that can come up with that sort of system? That was uh, a question that came up a lot in our uh, testing. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the power level that I'm looking for, where even a uh, early android is capable of stopping bullets and fighting whole teams of goons, uh, it's not analogous to most of the systems that people have played. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And we arrived at the point by being an old D&D fan myself, I I always was doing uh, random dice. uh, And that, after many rounds of discussion, didn't work out. It didn't really capture the feel of the heroic character we were looking for. It ended up with uh, mediocre characters. Uh, And then you could do a raise, which inspired the classes of androids that you can buy into the frontier the war form and from that that's how we're looking to get through this decision paralysis is uh we through these classes you know what to buy towards and i have a an first player an example in the character build mm-hmm. uh part of the rule book so to give a general idea of what your stats could be for an, an enjoyable experience. Yeah. Now, with the, with that in mind, I think it's I think it's important to de- to delve into certain aspects of ca- of character because there's again because a lot of times with games, even get even even brands making new ones, just when it comes to the core attributes, they they're usually in names that. Even if you're coming in new, you'll ha- you'll have um, some understanding of of the impo- of the importance of those ter- of those terms. But since we're dealing with androids and not dealing with humans or human equivalents, uh, there's a lot. And the fact that not everybody is an engineer, there's a lot of ter- there's a lot of terminology when it comes to the na- when it comes to the stats that a lot of people won't have won't have an easy analog for. Right. But, I'd like to I'd like to go into the I'd like to go into those starting with well output and how it's used in the game. 
Right. So uh, you can envision output as your battery. Mm -hmm. um, it is how you succeed on checks. The other sets make it easier uh, and inform play on how what checks you're good at. Mm -hmm. But someone with terrible stats and high output can continuously exhaust that resource to to make checks. The limitation being that you will eventually exhaust that resource. Mm -hmm. um, so, for instance, the generator class has a high output and coupled with that conductivity, uh, but the rest of the stats are pretty minimal. Uh, and their role would be to do these uh, miracle checks that uh, everyone else would be would burn themselves out trying to do. Mm -hmm. Now, next would be conductivity. Yes, conductivity. Um, this stat is, uh, in my mind, the, like the cables and wiring that connect to your battery, but uh, perhaps the more general public might see it as um, your connection, or maybe in like a magic system, your connection with your, your magical source, right? How, how deep is your uh, connection to your key or that sort of thing? Um, in, in the game, we you can spend up to spend power up to your conductivity, or I should say output, spend up to your conductivity in a check before uh, suffering negative effects. Um, so if you have low conductivity, you might have a big store of power, but or of output, but you won't be able to draw very heavily on it on any given check, mm -hmm. needing to space over time this draw from your, your pool. Now, next would be servo. Yeah, so this is like the strength chat, uh, stat in most other systems. Uh, it's how physically powerful your character is uh, before any other modifiers. Mm -hmm. uh, and computation is the processing version of servo. It's how quickly can you perform calculations. And I wanted to make clear it's not like the general intelligence or wisdom that's in my opinion up to the player but it's uh, an abstraction for how many calculations a second the android would be able to do right that that certainly makes sense that certainly makes sense uh, next would be well computation which i think is going to be one of the easier easier ones to figure out Right, so that's that's what I was saying. The servo is the strength, computation is the int, and then we go into shielding uh, after that. Would shielding be the con in that case? Uh, so shielding is... Um, it's analogous to con, but it doesn't work like con. So it, constitution in D&D &D gives you hit points, uh, and shielding's more like... Um, I want to say damage reduction, but the, the we don't you don't take hit point damage in this system. Uh, there's a table of negative effects that should something break through your shields uh, would apply to you. Mm -hmm. um, that goes into like the weapon analysis. So many of my weapons have like a negative twenty strength. And that would mean that it's applying a, tw uh, whatever your shielding would be, you would need to roll 20 less than that. Um, and there are many ways to bring output through conductivity into shielding, mm -hmm. uh, both temporary, to de varying degrees of temporary at varying prices. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, and the la the last one on the, the last one on the core stat list is attraction, which I'm guessing is not too far moved from charisma. That one is more cl closely uh, associated with charisma. It's um, how how menacing versus how 
uh, approachable you are to specifically uh, humans. I, I like to think that the uh, that the androids and other mechanicals have a different system of evaluating uh, each other, mm-hmm. but because these androids are so powerful and so immediately threatening, um, I thought it would be prudent for characters to have a way mechanically to either lean into that uh, intimidation or to do everything they could to be uh, as accommodating to uh, people as possible. Mm -hmm. Now... With with that kind of thing in mind, the ne- the um, the next thing I want one of the main things I wanted to ask on is the ch- is the chassis the seven and the seven mm-hmm. types. Um, right. Would it would it be accurate of me to say that ch- that chassis have more in common with archetypes than strict classes? Right. I I would definitely agree with that. Um, the the chassis gives you a feature. Uh, and it makes it easier to get into certain modifications, um, but otherwise provides no no other benefit. Uh, so archetype would, I think, be a, a great way of saying that. Yeah. And within the within the uh, ar- the archety- now within the archetypes, I'm guessing that. I'm guessing that um, custom is ba- is basically for those who want to go want to um, go off the go off the beaten path, whereas the other si- other six chassis are for are for um, emphasizing a particular style. Yeah, that's certainly correct. The uh, I wouldn't recommend custom for a first time player, but in the hopes that somebody plays this game twice, I I would like. Uh, a, a chassis that lets people interact with these modifications a little more thoroughly than uh, the other chassis might. Mm-hmm. Now, given that, I would I would like to go through the I would like to go through the chassis that you have, and ex- and expand into what expand into um what sort what sort of fantasy that particular chassis is meant to embody. And I'll start with the diplomatic one. So the diplomatic chassis, uh, many players are familiar with the party face or uh, the people person. The face man. And the face man, exactly. Um, and so the diplomatic chassis is uh, fulfilling a couple different archetypes. There's the like suave uh, negotiator, where through subtle negotiation, uh, the release of uh, biological hormones or other just room-affecting modifications or just being prepared and knowing who you're negotiating with, you can really just turn turn whole companies uh, or countries to your side uh, with just a series of good negotiations. But it's also the... Uh, the town, the most liked guy in town. Everyone recognizes the android, uh, known as a good person and an upstanding member of the community. You're doing a lot of conversations with uh, the biological people of the of the galaxy. Mm-hmm. So ne- next would be the frontier chassis. Yeah, so the the Frontier chassis uh, is born from the lore that I have envisioned for this game. One of the things I had to ask myself was, why would why would a company ever make a, an android if they're so powerful uh, and so difficult per- to produce? Um, why would anybody ever make one? And the one of the reasons I came up with was terraforming. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's hard to send people to terraform a planet that's hostile to people. 
Uh, so having a powerful Android or a team of powerful Androids uh, often would make that go easier. And so the Frontier Android is supposed to be um, generally good at everything because they're going to be far from support for many years at a time. Um, and the modifications go into like uh, land survey, uh, structural analysis, uh, but they also go into like uh, frontier defense. Uh, if you're going to be the only people out there for long periods of time and you get attacked by pirates or raiders, you have to be ready to defend the homestead. Yeah. Now, next would be the ge the generator chassis. Yes. So the generator chassis is uh, my personal favorite. Uh, <laughs> in testing, I was the only one with that opinion. Uh, the generator has this large battery and ability to refresh it every day. Uh, and they're focused in powering large machines, but also, crucially, powering the other androids in the party. Uh, so, uh, a support chassis, if there ever was one. Mm -hmm. And um, I can kind of infer what the hauler chassis would be would be about, but <laughs> but um, I'd like you to go into that. Sure, yeah. The hauler chassis uh, is a chassis built to be big, with big muscles, uh, and perform great uh, physical feats. Uh, it originally envisioned as, like, uh, able to mine and haul out all the ore from uh, a coal mine or maybe a gold mine or whatever a company would be commissioning a uh, an android for and their their modifications get into bigger hydraulics bigger wheels uh, all sorts of uh, tunneling equipment it's a very industrial robot mm -hmm. and um, next would be the technician which I'm guessing would be the closest thing to a skill monkey in this, even though you're not really using a skill system. Yes. Uh, so the technician with the high computation and access to easy access to modifications uh, that improve uh, the extended actions. The extended actions are where you will find hacking, uh, but also repair and... Uh, any of this detail work that that would all be encompassed by the technician class. Mm -hmm. And lastly, the war chassis, which again is self-explanatory. Yes, uh, but notable features of the war chassis: you you have a max attraction. Everybody knows what a a war chassis is. What a war chassis does. If a war chassis is in town, uh, it's bad news for the town, and so I have that attraction capped out. Um, and they they push into the servo, but not as heavily as the hauler, and they they have the easiest access to extremely large guns. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what I could, one thing that I could one thing that I couldn't help but notice is that the the primary the primary means of advancement is through mod slots. Yes. And if I'm not mis if I'm not mistaken, the set the setup that you have with mod slots is that while there while there there are some that are universal and that there are some that are freeform. Mm -hmm. I.e. at i.e. anyone can anyone can pick it. Right. But when it comes, yeah. oh, go ahead. No, I uh, go ahead. Oh, but when it comes to when it comes, but when it comes to mod, when it comes to mod slots, I had also seen that the that the whole thing with um with level with leveling, since you had, 
would it be fair to, would it be fair to say that that especially given how the character sheet is set up that there's kind of an understanding that you're not going to be sticking with a cer with a certain loadout for entire campaigns yeah so i'm i'm hoping that everyone uh grows with the character because there's not an experience track it's all uh like event or module or module based, you'll mm -hmm. complete an arc, gain a level, gain some mod slots, uh, spend the money you make from that job to to buy those mods. And being an android, you can customize yourself for every upcoming job. Say you're doing one of these terraforming events, and you're gonna want a big bigger battery because it'll be hard to recharge, or you'll want to ditch the conversation module you picked up because there's only going to be six of you. So you pick up instead uh, some water purification uh, modules, you know. Uh, I want I want the players to be relatively free to mix and match for both their personal preference and the job at hand. Um, and in this way, you you don't fall into a rhythm like you might in uh, Pathfinder 2E or D&D uh, 5E where every adventure, every encounter may be different, but you're solving it the same way. Mm -hmm. Now, given the fact that you're not that, you mentioned you're not doing um, a standard health or wound point system and, inst and instead doing, the, uh, doing a damage table, do you have do you have it set where where um where even with all the tech and customiz customizability that androids have they are they are so they are still somewhat squishy once you get past all the outer stuff. So uh, there's two main ways that an android may expire. The one that I found in testing to be more common. Uh, and thus had a lot of the attention to it was the burnout table where players get a little over eager they spend too much power um, and, and they blow themselves up <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and so a lot of care was put into making sure that you would either need to be truly desperate or uh, making obviously incorrect decisions to blow yourself up but the but the level of danger is still there if you want to do something uh, heroic that you might not be suited for like uh, stopping a tactical nuke with your shields right um, that that might be good good and fun for the town that you save them for but that's that's almost certainly going to exhaust you whereas with the core breach table, if you're caught off guard and your shields are down, mm -hmm. uh, that could be bad business. But more commonly, what will happen is over the course of a day or two, someone trying to take an uh, android down would be laying traps, doing hit-and-run ambushes. The androids might not even understand that they're under attack yet at the very beginning of an encounter, mm -hmm. just, because, just because of the stretched nature that that attrition that has to occur to the point where you find that you actually can't power your shields, uh, you know, after two days of fighting. And uh, that that's the uh, the moment that they've made a mistake, or the re they realize they've made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, um, given how given how output is essentially the battery. <laughs> Could be considered the extra effort battery in some right. cases. <laughs> Sorry, carbonation. Have have you did you have any instances in play testing where people were a bit defensive regarding output use, or was it getting used fairly frequently in tests? Yeah. So. Uh... That that was the split between the the hard mode and the standard mode. So in the standard mode, you regenerate every twenty four hours uh, some multiplier of your conductivity. So the giving conductivity a secondary purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, and it's it's fairly generous, so people felt free to uh, use this up. Uh, and being uh, the game master, I was able to work with this to make to either rev up or rev down the severity of encounters uh, based on kind of how burnt out they were. So I think it's a good running guide for. It's like if you had a party of wizards, you and they started running out of spell slots, you would know. Now's the time to go for the throat or to hold back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um. But, I still like the idea of having permanent, uh, a permanent resource that you had to make hard decisions. You know, if you're if you're an immortal android, and you want to be a good person. But saving the town takes ten percent of your total output. Mm-hmm. It is is the life of a hundred people worth ten percent of an immortal's life? That's that's interesting philosophical question. Still philosophical questions that not every player wants to engage with, but some did, and so that's why we had the hard mode where you have instead of a thousand power that regenerates every day, mm-hmm. or regenerates some every day, you have two million power. And it never regenerates. Mm -hmm. And of course, of course, I can. And given given the way the um, the way the core breach table is set up, I can definitely see where where um, Pathfinder, not Pathfinder, where Traveler was an influence because, well, Traveler doesn't have health hasn't doesn't have health points either. It it um it has it that you're taking damage directly to your attributes. Oh. Yeah. Although so I was just going to say that uh, you can repair much of these uh, in town after the fight's done, uh, or if you have the supplies handy, that's where technician chassis comes in handy, is they'll have uh, substitutes or will be better at uh, repairing these damages. And uh, I wanted it to kind of cascade. The harder the harder you get hit, the the more problems you have to deal with. Now, one particular one particular battle cry I saw I saw in I saw in the past regarding the re- regarding the game is um failure is failure is optional. Right. And what I'm curious about is or rather success is always an option is is the it, as the uh, design philosophy, and what I'm curious about is what that entails, and what and what sparked that particular philosophy. Yeah, so uh, if we're going into the super heroic, being that it's even more heroic than say your characters of Pathfinder or D and D into what I would even call it like a mythical character, a character who, uh, like a demigod in the old Greek dramas, uh, and who faces adversity on scales that people could not uh, interact with, but always finds a way to succeed and are only undone by their own folly. Um... And it, and it happens to pair nicely with the rule set I had in mind, where you can spend this resource to succeed on checks. Uh, for instance, if you were to roll a, a hard check, B10 under, or B10 over the, uh, the target, and spend 10 power to, or 10 output to make the target, uh, you can always choose to succeed, but you start playing into that attrition uh, and being closer to your your folly that undoes you. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes now when it comes to science fiction, developing a science fiction world can be dis- can be summarized a bit facetiously as a series of questions, and the answers to those being more questions. So in that in that regard 
would you say would would you say that it would be accurate of, of me to, to describe sentient circuits as hard leaning not necessarily hard sf but definitely leaning a little bit towards that yes uh so the the question is what would how would society react to a power source of this density uh conceptually i was thinking uh what if you had a fusion plant analogous to a modern fission plant but in the size and weight of um of like a couple d cells right that that level of energy harnessing would revolutionize the world uh so that was the first question how how would people try to harness that power how would people react to that power uh the next question was w such a such a power source would be unstable uh humanity throws ai and uh deep learning at these sort of difficult questions how would uh such a artificial intelligence react and grow over time to the demands placed on it um you know if you only tell the ai keep keep yourself alive that's that's not always going to work out amazingly well for the humans so with with these small changes you get a universe that is familiar to our own, but distinctly alien. Mm -hmm. And one one of the big one of the big elephants in the room anytime you're dealing with um, science fiction is go is going to be FTL travel. And I'm get and I'm guessing just because of just because of your status as an engineer, that's something that you end up giving a lot of thought as to how as to how you'd have FTL travel work. Yes, and it ties into how I am explaining this power source. Um, so, the idea is that you would, if you're able to control space time to any degree, you're able to change the relative speed of uh, objects in a field. So, in regards to how the power source would work, is it some sort of fusion plant that you're able to control the space time of to accelerate or decelerate depending on your need? Um, there's a ongoing hypothetical question in the physics realm with the Cuvier drive where you bend space around yourself and push space and in sentient circuits uh this is proven to be true um recent research papers cast, cast some additional doubt on the cubier drive but it's a it's a fun and useful device for science fiction and so we ran with it mm -hmm. now with the with that in mind these Given given that given that sort of that sort of tra that sort of travel, um, to put to put it into practice, how long on that kind of system? How long would it take for someone to go from, let's say, Earth to Mars? Yeah. So, uh, setting down some levels of tech, um, we have a ca a capture process where a space structure pulls you out of the warp bubble that you've generated to get there. Mm -hmm. um, so for androids, they don't have to worry so much about deceleration and exotic particles and all this nastiness, and they are able to go much faster. So Earth to Mars would be under an hour for an android, maybe a couple hours for uh, humans. And this discrepancy in timing and what is necess the necessary infrastructure on both ends, uh, I hope leads players and GMs into interesting 
uh, conflicts where why is an android being sent to this war front? Well, they can get there today as opposed to next week for human troops, or uh, they can get there without the proper capturing structure, whereas human troops might be jelloed. And even with, even with that, are are there are there some ways for for humans to go to go at, to to be to survive in an FTL ship, or is it or or is it not that easy? Yeah. So uh, there's a, a structure called an FTL net, uh, being a m- m- ceramic metallic net like physical net in space that'll capture all these uh electrical particles and strange quarks and stuff that comes off of a collapsing warp bubble to allow humans to make these faster than light jumps the reason why it's slower uh being that you have to be able to capture all of these and the hypothetical rate of these particles coming off is proportional to the speed you're going. So they can go faster. In this universe, people can go faster than light. Androids just go faster than that. Mm-hmm. Oh. Now, since, since we went with something something simil- something something small when it comes to just going from Earth to Mars, let's go let's go all the way out to the former planet. How long in that system? How long would it take to go from Earth to Pluto? So, I have uh, don't have these numbers uh, perfectly down. I have generated the what are called the old colonies, which are kind of the colonies that people go to or were able to go through on colony ships, and the new colonies, which. Uh, we're only achievable than faster than light. So, uh, you know, it might be like going to New Zealand uh, f- for Pluto, where, you know, you can maybe do it in a day, but with the connecting flights and all that, you're probably going to, you're going to probably be there for take a couple days or a week. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so... Uh, certainly capable to do in in system business as a person, and even vacation or move to outer solar systems. Um, but it wouldn't be a common occurrence for anyone but the most uh, most well off. Mm-hmm. And when it com- when it comes to when you when you mentioned the whole idea of of old colonies and new colonies, I'm guessing when it comes to a lot of the old ones, they they um they would have they would have arrived onto the under those planets on generational ships. Yes, exactly. Oh, and in in the same in the same vein, that divide between old and new, I keep getting of I keep getting reminded of something that we see in a lot of a lot of westerns or the, or the like. Of the of the more established um, civilized central areas, and the more lo- the more the more free, although although risky, um, border areas. Or since you brought since you're familiar with since you've dipped into BattleTech, uh, the um, the inner sphere and the periphery. Yeah. Um... An int- there, that's that has good parallels, but an interesting twist would be the old colonies have had many years to develop their own culture before Earth was able to recontact them with these uh, new methods of space travel. Mm-hmm. And so Earth itself is isolated by a number of colonies that are ideologically different to it uh, because... Th- People develop different cultures over time, and what works on a generational ship, usually more of a communal lifestyle, um, is opposed to the forces that would make generational ships. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, uh, so it you you almost have 
the planets with sympathies closest to Earth are the ones that are furthest from Earth. Mm -hmm. Do they have do they have like a romanticized view of Earth, view of Earth? The the old colonies will have as many uh, different cultures as the game master would like. I have some suggestions built into the core book, uh, but given that the Kickstarter uh, didn't work out the way I wanted it to, uh, I have left much of the world building to be uh, in the hands of whomever starts a game. Uh, just with a, with enough key concepts and hooks to get a feel for the system. All, all right, that's that certainly makes sense. Now, given given you mentioned it, you you mentioned early on a bit of a, a bit of a more quote unquote hardcore mode. Yes. When it comes to, when it comes to the mechanics, what prompt what prompted that particular idea? Yeah. So. Early on in playtesting, hard mode was always the first mode in my uh, design, is having this, having the success is always an option, uh, or failure is optional in this mode. Uh, um, having the concept of a resource that you can always tap into that's very powerful, but you might choose not to, uh, and then com combining that with uh, immortality that being mechanical provides, mm -hmm. uh, it it really tapped into several play spaces I wanted to interact with that I hadn't seen in uh, other RPGs. Of oftentimes in RPGs, things happen to a player. I wanted a player to happen to places. And this hard mode gives you the option to be its savior or to let a place wither. Mm -hmm. um, and it brings up these questions of how invested is your character? How how far, what would you sacrifice to complete the storyline? Mm -hmm. um, but not everyone wants that on their, their day off. <laughs> to to delve into these uh, these more morality questions, these philosophical questions, into and not every GM wants players who just decide to not to save the village. It makes it very difficult to uh, anticipate where the party is going to go if they're like, I don't know, I only have fifty thousand output left. You know, if I save this town. Could be the end of my life, and it also pushes pl players in a direction. This hard mode uh, into being more evil characters um, in D and D, especially you. You have a problem where two a third to two thirds of the alignment chart isn't used. Uh, the evil characters, evil players, are always uh, shunned either at the table because they're like why are you why would you want to play that or mechanically because uh, people won't render them aid <laughs> and so I wanted to at least give people the temptation to do something like crack open a uh, fellow android and eat their eat their power generator to live a little longer because once you go through 10 sessions, 12 sessions of hard mode, you're going to really be like, man, I can't, how many more sessions can I really partake in, you know? Um, I'll be on fumes if I decide to do anything big. Uh, and you'll, that sense of starvation can, if not drive a player to do something drastic, at least understand why someone might uh, be tempted to steal or do any number of crimes to, to get to the next day. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that, in, with that in mind, 
I know that the I know that the original Kickstarter didn't didn't work mm-hmm. out the way you had the way you had planned, but um, what what do you ha- what do you what have you been planning for down the road when it comes to this the concept of sentient circuits? Yeah, so uh, I got it out about a month ago. I I have two modules, one of which is included with the uh, release. The second module is uh, currently undergoing some edits and revisions. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, if there's a lot of demand, maybe I, I get in there with more modules. But from what I've seen, I've had about 100 downloads uh, on drive through mm-hmm. uh, which is fantastic. Uh, I'm glad people are at least giving it a look, but... It's not the the level of engagement that, especially since I'm moving uh, at the start of the next year, that makes me feel super necessary to bring new modules out. Um, honestly, my my hope is to go to a a, a convention with a, a three ring binder printed out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and tell people, hey, I've got this system who's looking for a pickup game, and maybe after doing that a couple times, someone will recognize the the book. Mm-hmm. Well, I hope to I hope to at the very at the very least add to, add to that with um with the to- with the time here in the temple. Oh, but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and and take part in the madness that always happens around here yeah and i i enjoy being invited on uh you know when i was making the the game i just wanted to to get it out there see if anybody would enjoy it and i never even thought the anyone would take notice so it's it's been great exceeded my wildest expectations already (laughs) (laughs) well it's what is what i do Anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further go into more of sentient circuits, um, science fiction as a whole, or what, or why every engineer is banned from creating the arrow of total destruction in Pathfinder. Right. Which, as an engineer, I'm pretty sure you've seen that joke. Yes. <laughs> uh, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>